now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the heart of them, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord.
got to worship the festival was the Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip told Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Jerusalem, the event we will actually celebrate next Sunday. <laughs> it is time for the Passover. So many Judeans, like Jesus and his followers, are filling the city for this holy celebration. And there were non-Jewish people that came to worship also. Some were proselytes and seekers, like these Greeks that run into Philip and say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. It's almost as if they are a prophetic scouting party. Because remember, right before this, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, and Mary has washed Jesus' feet with expensive nard to prepare him for what was to come. Everything has been pointing not just to the crucifixion, but to the resurrection. Not just about Jesus, but to the ultimate cosmic glory of God. Now, a bit of telephone tag ensued at this request, because Philip tells Andrew, and then Philip and Andrew go tell Jesus. But why this consultation? Were they a bit uncomfortable letting outsiders in? Maybe they were suspicious about what the Greeks wanted with Jesus. We don't really know if Jesus met with these Greeks, but the conversation launched Jesus into a discourse where he uses this opportunity to tell those around him that it's time. He has spent the majority of this gospel up until now saying, my hour has not yet come. But now, after his final entry into Jerusalem, he says, it's time now. 
And folks, and if folks want to see Jesus, here's what they're in for. So pay attention, disciples. Again, Jesus tries to explain what they should expect. Not just the Greeks, those on the outside, but also to his Jewish disciples who have been following him for three years. We all still have a hard time accepting Jesus on his terms, not ours. Just like the followers did 2,000 years ago. So no wonder we need to keep hearing the gospel over and over. Because Jesus knows how we think. Jesus knows the world we live in. When we hear the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, perhaps we think of power and might, a superhero action figure that's going to help us righteous folk win a physical battle and outpower our enemies. We always want to win, Hollywood style. Our culture the system which operates this world is based on a myth that the way to bring order out of chaos is through violently defeating the other. And the way to deal with threats from enemies is by violently eliminating them as the system seeks to do to Jesus. So the very next thing Jesus says stops us in our tracks because it's not how we think about power. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. See, our power and might thinking, our desire to always be on the winning side of a battle because we are the good guys, is actually small thinking. God's power is in what looks like weakness. And boy, do we struggle with that. But it operates from a power of love that may appear weak, fragile, and small. But ultimately, it's how death is defeated. If we live only for the love of ourselves, that will ultimately lead to our demise. To live for God is to live for others, and that ultimately leads to life perpetual. But nature tells the story of God's greatness through weakness all the time. A tiny grain, that is a symbol for God? A grain that gets buried in the dark earth where no one can see it? That's power? Yet even though we know that single grains or seeds fall to the ground year after year and turn into food that feeds us or a mighty oak tree or blue bonnets, <laughs> we do not understand this lesson. So God just keeps on telling it. We want to see Jesus. A Jesus of our own making, or the Jesus that is revealed as a vulnerable baby. A man of little success and income, a man who prefers to hang with the poor, a man who was an immigrant that had to flee with his family to another country to spare his life, and ultimately a man who purposefully enters a city and into the oppressor's hands because he is willing to take on this debt for all people. Is this the Jesus we want to see? A Jesus that opens up the opportunity for all people to enter the glory of God? All people is why the Greeks get snuck in here. Because Jesus' followers are going to have to open up outside of their own tribe. As we approach Palm Sunday next week, Keep in mind what Jesus told the dis his disciples and tells us today. We want to see Jesus, and here he is.
He beckons us. No one is turned away unless they choose to do so themselves. But are we willing to let go of the lives we think we want and follow him? Stop clinging to the lives we think we deserve and instead live for others? Because that's the Jesus way. And if we do follow him, he asks us to do so as servants. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. Servanthood isn't easy. Servants aren't often thanked for their work. And servants sacrifice a lot for others. But to serve out of love for God and others is a game changer. We do not make this decision to degrade ourselves. We make this decision out of love. It's just not well appreciated in our society. We don't serve with Jesus because we're coerced into serving. We choose to serve out of love for love. It is this God that sees Christ in the meek and lowly, the poor, the unwelcome, the misfits, and often those that are just denied a seat at the table. And I'm willing to bet that each one of us has someone in mind we would rather not be sitting at our table. Which makes it really hard to point the finger at folks. The Gospel of John is pointing out to us followers of Jesus that it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about God. And paradoxically, the good news is that Jesus is about all people. Jesus is saying, I am going to judge the oppressive systems of this world and drive them out and will draw all people to myself. Jesus asks us to let go of our lives and live for something other than ourselves. The key in letting go of our lives and letting go of clinging to what we think we want and what we think we deserve is that we don't do it alone. Jesus isn't asking anything of us he himself wasn't willing to do, and we go together. Are you afraid of where following Jesus leads? That's okay, so is Jesus. My soul is troubled, he said. But what am I going to do? Not see this thing through? No, the stakes are too high. I've come to this hour for all people, and I will be that little grain and fall and get buried in the rich soil of the earth, and I will be lifted up. You want to see Jesus? You're going to see him lifted up on the cross. You may think death is the end, but stay a while with Jesus and you will see not triumph of earthly violent battle, but triumph over death itself. We are about to walk into a week where we celebrate a Christ that was not only lifted up on a cross, but lifted up from the grave and lifted up from this earth into the glory of God. Our faith is trust that that is our eternal life, begun now and will be. The seed that falls to the ground does not die. It begins life. We are today's followers of Christ. As we near the passion of Christ, a celebration that was once celebrated as the Passover, suppose a group of folks show up here that, were clear, that are clearly not one of us. 
and said, excuse me, we want to see Jesus. What would we show them? 